Hello and welcome to this special Spears Wealth Insight Forum panel brought to you in association with Henley and Partners. The topic under discussion today is global investment migration and our compelling title is Wealth, Power and Sovereignty, Exploring the New Age of HNW Migration. Joining us today to discuss this uh, subject is a panel comprising several of the leading practitioners in the private client field. First, we have the Spears columnist and the doyen of private client and migration law, Keris Gardner of MGT. Uh, next, I'm delighted to say that from the world of wealth management, we have Theophanis Theophanus, co-head of strategic clients and family offices at Barclays Private Bank. Finally, it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Christian uh, Kylin, Chairman of Henley & Partners, the leading provider of investment migration services to global HWs, and of course, the sponsor of this panel. Welcome everyone. Um, our first question I'd like to address is to really get a better understanding of the lie of the land in the world of investment migration today. So uh, perhaps Christian, I could turn to you. What are you and what are your colleagues at Henley & Partners uh, seeing um, in terms of international flows and global investment migration because of COVID-19? What influence is it having? Oh, well, it is quite an interesting time, isn't it, in, in several uh, ways. Um, I think all of us have had this experience now with a rather unprecedented situation, a really globally unprecedented situation. I was just uh, an hour ago having a discussion on that as well, and we said basically since time immemorial there has never been such a situation in the world where the whole globe was more or less locked down. And so what we have seen dealing directly with uh, immigration matters, we have seen, of course, borders close, uh, visas cancelled, uh, government counters closed. So it's a complete shutdown on that. So while, let's say, banks could continue to interact with their clients um, and do certain things and provide services, we, we couldn't. We could still interact with clients, but we couldn't do anything because you basically had a situation you could, in many cases, not even go to the local notary and notarize your passport, let, a no, let alone hand in documents uh, with foreign governments that shut down uh, their offices. So immigration services from governments have shut in large parts of the world. There are very few countries that were open. So this has had a dramatic impact uh, during this time for, for our business because nobody, of course, will simply proceed with things when you'd have no clue how things continue and everything is more or less shut. So <laughs> this is rather a usual, unusual uh, and very um, special experience for, for us. At the same time, we have had, however, a spike in demand. So a lot of people mm, that uh, maybe previously didn't quite looked at that right now, they now have come to us and, and they want uh, the services we provide. So now that these lockdowns have um, eased, uh, at least in large parts uh, of the world, there's still, however, many countries that are in lockdown, but quite a few have eased and you can travel again, uh, immigration um, offices are open with governments. Um, the demand has uh, come back dramatically. So we have even more uh, work to do than before. So on one hand, there's a catch up with this, with this uh, three or so months of lockdown. On the other hand, there are, is a whole like new dimension of people that are looking at why it may make sense to have access rights uh, to countries. And that's not least uh, the health situation. So we now have, let's say, Italian families that are thinking, well, in the next lockdown, I'd rather not be in Italy. Yeah. I want to have a residence permit, say, in Switzerland, or uh, maybe a, an Austrian citizenship or citizenship in Cyprus or, or a residence permit in Greece or somewhere else where it was more reasonable and you could pass the time better and there were better health services. So and now there's a whole like, new dimension uh, of, of that that has opened, which is rather interesting too, and we are very busy with that. So it's, it's quite a remarkable time the last few months. And without wanting to put you on the spot, you mentioned, you know, Italians looking to go elsewhere, but what other, are there other uh, people that you can, you're happy to tell us are looking elsewhere? Who, are, who else is on the move? Oh, it's worldwide. I mean, you have had say, situations in, in Brazil, for instance, where, you know, private hospitals were closed and rec 
required for everyone. So you couldn't even go to the, the doctors where you wanted to, if you had even the access normally. So there also was, you know, it was becoming relevant. Can I travel somewhere maybe to do that? Um, what access rights do I have? And really at the peak of the lockdown, it came down to nationality. So, you know, Germans could go back to Germany, British citizens could go back to Britain, Swiss people could go to Switzerland, Italians could travel back to Italy. The EU was becoming irrelevant. Um, the whole freedom uh, of movement in the EU collapsed completely. It just mattered what nationality you have and what international, sorry, what national residence permit maybe you have to have access to specific countries that you wanted to go to. And this is uh, unprecedented, I think, um, and opens new challenges to people, but also, of course, you know, we need to think beyond those challenges and find solutions. And this is a completely global phenomenon. So we've had the situation in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, in North America, everywhere. But of course, primarily you will see with wealthy people that they are looking at where can I access healthcare in such situation, this has never happened before. And it, it shows that actually the access rights are really important. And when you previously had say citizenship in a place where uh, you had access rights quite easily, need for travel or, or even you know, in Europe, even settlement rights, this has been completely thrown overboard. So, you, you know, there's a new dimension to think about that. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, Keris, um, as someone who deals with advisors on migration law to H&Ws, what, what are you seeing coming across your desk, uh, wherever that may be now, um, as, we go, mm -hmm. as we've gone through COVID-19 and, and, and looking at months ahead? Yes, well, picking up on a few things that Chris said, we're seeing exactly the same thing. So, for example, uh, what COVID has definitely done is concentrated people's minds on what's important to them when they are looking to um, move from one country to another with a result of, as Chris just mentioned, healthcare facilities have suddenly come rocketing up to uh, the, you know, the list of what I want when I, when I move. Um, and it was never, never featured really before. Um, as a result of which, um, anecdotally, because I haven't got any clients who are looking at the moment, but I hear others have, uh, people are even thinking of how about New Zealand? Because they, they have ostensibly done so well um, during the COVID crisis and kept numbers down very low. Um, that people are apparently interest, showing interest in, in uh, acquiring a New Zealand passport. So um, interesting, interesting development there. But yes, definitely medical and healthcare facilities have come up the list you know, exponentially, I think, in, in my view. People have really had concentrate, concentrated their minds as a result of this COVID pandemic. And as a result, um, again, harking back to what Chris said earlier, um, there has been pe there's a pent up demand which is starting to be released now that um, movement between countries is relaxing a little, nowhere near back to normal, obviously, but um, we are seeing those effects and people coming through the door, yeah. Okay, and, and then turning to you, uh, Theophanes, from a wealth management perspective, um, wh where's the money coming from, where's it going to, and what, what's the impact of COVID uh, therein? Well, for us, the impact of COVID, was that we had to serve our clients differently, as you appreciate. We cannot travel. We used to be regular travelers. Now we have to do everything through WebEx. Uh, there are certain countries where we cannot travel. Lately, though, we saw clients flying into London, asking us to have meetings. Uh, the centers that we, we, we see demand for all of our booking centers from London to Ireland, Monte Carlo, Jersey, Switzerland. I we have people that work, they want to book assets there from their home countries. Clients are looking to diversify uh, and be safe if there is another crisis coming. At the same time, we saw an in a lot of clients with an increase in interest in healthcare post COVID-19 and, and to invest in, in private capital related to the sector as well as financial technology, uh, FinTech or tech NIT. So we see that there is, a diff there is more demand for investments, especially trading. We traded a lot during those days. Clients saw it as an opportunity and they got positions. In the market. Okay, and, and in terms of the um, people coming and going, have you, have you seen people coming and going as a result of COVID? I mean, obviously once the lockdown has been released, 
Have you seen people come bringing money to London? Have you, have you seen yeah. anything you can? We see people coming into London yeah. and there is an interest to open, to move assets to London or move their families to London. And there, there are people who got plans to come to London on the 6th of April, mm. but these were postponed, they're moving in. We did also see a few cases where clients relocated to other countries out of London to, sm to smaller countries, but these are minority. Okay, brilliant. Well, let's turn to the other big question of the day, um, and one that is obviously getting bigger by the day here, um, and that's Brexit. Um, what is the impact of Brexit on uh, the UK? Uh, who's leaving? Um, who's coming? Um, and what impact is it having on our attractiveness um, to global H&Ws? And um, Christian, um, I think you're probably the best person to give us the big picture on, on this one, because you'll, you'll know um, what your spreadsheets are saying. Yeah, I mean, I have always said, and it continues to be the opinion that the Brexit is pretty irrelevant from our point of view. So I think whether or not Britain is in the EU or not, um, basically for the kind of clients we, we deal with, uh, doesn't really matter very much. Um, there are advantages of being in the EU and there are advantages of not being in the EU. For Britain itself, probably doesn't matter very much either. I think Likewise, you can, you know, analyze that for a long time, but there are many pros and cons on either side. But from the European Union point of view, there is a difference. And I think uh, the EU has a big loss with uh, Britain leaving. I think the only thing, and this question comes up all the time, and I've been asked, and my colleagues have been asked this all the time, what will happen then on, you know, we produce these uh, famous uh, passport index and the quality of nationality index, what will happen to Britain uh, on, on that? Will Britain fall down these indexes? And first of all, on the passport index, um, there will be no change at all because it just reflects travel. So of course, British, citizens will still be able to go on holidays in Spain and travel to Frankfurt for meetings, for business or whatever, that will not change. The British passport will remain a very, very good travel document. On the quality of nationality index side, it's a bit more complicated because it's a much more complex measure of, as the title indicates, the quality of nationality. And here there is a real danger that Britain could uh, fall quite a bit in this uh, quality of nationality index. And that is because if there was a kind of uh, Brexit where there is no settlement rights or very restricted settlement rights of British citizens in the EU, then that would of course impact the quality of nationality because one of the uh, strengths of European nationality is that you have settlement rights in 27 countries. This is, for instance, why Canada is not as attractive as a European nationality, because if you're Canadian, you can only settle in Canada. But if you're Finnish, you can also live in Spain or even in Switzerland, or if you're Italian, you can uh, move uh, to Germany or wherever. And if that were to happen, then Britain would fall in this quality of nationality index. However, my opinion is that there will be some kind of arrangement that will avoid that. And that's simply on the back of not the rhetoric and what you read in the newspaper every day, but basically there were arrangements found with Norway or with Switzerland. Um, so I'm sure we'll find an arrangement between the EU and Britain. I would be surprised if not. Okay, that's good. So, um, I mean, it sounds like um, for H&W migration terms, Britain is Brexit proof, uh, which is, I suppose, pretty good news. Uh, Dear Fannis, if I can turn to you, um, what is the impact um, in a financial term, uh, terms of Brexit? I mean, is, is money leaving uh, this country as a result of Brexit? Do you think GCH and W is taking it away? Well, as you know, we're focused on busyness and we are very, very busy. That's my answer. We are super busy. So, so categorically, you say there's no money's leaving as far as you can tell uh, because of Brexit. I, I, I'm not going to comment on that. What I'm saying is I'm super, super busy with work. So you're as busy as ever. Well, that's good. <laughs> Keris, I'll, I'll, I'll step yeah. away from, from, from... Let me put it this way. I have three things that I've never worked so hard in my life. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll, take some, I, I'll take that as a good sign. Uh, Keris, um, 
from a from a Brexit perspective, and you know, with your yeah. hat on as an advisor yeah. in immigration, what are you yeah. seeing? Are people coming and going? Yes, very much so. Um, interesting uh, what, what Chris's take on it. I'm, I'm glad I like the optimistic uh, finish to what he said there. Uh, and I, I do hope that happens uh, for my own sake, <laughs> not for anything else. Um, but um, yeah, what our clients are doing, um, EU citizens already here in the UK, we are really quite um, strongly encouraging them to get themselves sorted so that at least they have, if not settled status, then pre-settled status, which um, they're entitled to obtain and indeed if they just sort of come in for a, a couple of days they can they can apply for pre-settled status so why wouldn't you do it would be my would be my uh, take take on the matter um but we've only got until the 31st of december and uh, so you know they've got to get their skates on the ones that haven't done anything um we are still getting a number of european nationals european union nationals that is coming through um asking for help to get them sorted on the uh, settled status or pre-settled status um, uh, that they're entitled to. Um, what I'm expecting, I don't know whether Chris would agree with this, um, because after, after the 1st of January, um, the, um, the sort of the, uh, how can I put it, um, everything is equal in terms of um, non-EU nationals and EU nationals, then if we don't get some sort of a deal on um, coming to the UK to work, for example, uh, then we're going to have a lot more work involved in sort of getting people sponsorship licenses to enable them to bring EU workers into the country um, at, at the very least. Um, and then, of course, any other visas that they, they might need for uh, study or whatever it may be coming to the UK as well. So, you know, uh, I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of demand post the 1st of January because with all those EU nationals who haven't sorted themselves out, um, if they are going to be coming to the UK, and let's face it, we'll want their talent here in the UK, um, then, you know, the, um, there's a shift, the ground is shifting for them uh, pretty soon. Okay, that's very good. Well, look, let's turn to the bigger picture, uh, if there is one, outside COVID and Brexit. What, what, and perhaps this is for you, Chris, first of all, um, what are the other big uh, trends in terms of people, people movement uh, in the H and W uh, sphere, at least, that you are observing. Well, it just increases every year. I mean, that's interesting. And despite uh, again the the political environments, or maybe because of the political environments in various parts of the world that are more protectionist, uh, more populist, um, there are more uncertainty. Um, there is more mobility, more people looking at alternatives, and so. We are like um, we heard before. We are also very busy, and every year we are more busy. So that just means I think these trends will continue. I'm pretty sure it's quite clear. Okay. Um, having looked at um, sort of a little bit about where people are going to and where they're coming from, um, if we can um, turn the question inside out and ask why people are moving, uh, is it uh, to do with um, wealth structuring or geopolitics or freedom of travel um what what are what are the reasons that drive people to travel i'll i'll give chris a break for a second start with keris um what what, what do you see coming across your desk in terms of why people are coming here or elsewhere yeah you're right there is there is a list um which we you know we sort of go through with clients and tick them off but the first the first one actually is um the fact that some people have such diabolical passports when it comes to quality that they they just desperately need uh, a passport that will give them access to uh, visa free travel uh, that's why the st kitts passport was so popular and still is so popular because it does give that freedom so they're looking for freedom of mobility definitely mm -hmm. Um, but that's not necessarily the, the driver for many uh, wealthy people. Um, they're looking for um, safety uh, in terms of a safe and secure place to live, particularly where there's political turmoil uh, in the country that they are living in, or you know, even worse, war and conflict. So that is a, dri a major driver. Um, also the fear of that. So for example, we've always got a trickle of Middle Eastern clients looking for um, a safe haven. We've always got a trickle of South American clients looking for a safe haven. And very often, um, and Chris, I know Chris does this because they have a huge database on this, we're asked to just run, run our sort of finger over the pros and cons of various jurisdictions to see what might suit uh, clients the most, given their circumstances. So if they've got youngish children of school age, 
they're very keen on uh, the UK. Um, obviously, not, not exclusively the UK, Switzerland also, but um, well, obviously they're quite good for that as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to miss Switzerland. Um, our education system, you know, is the envy of many a country. And so, again, that's a, that's a major driver for some families. Brilliant. Okay. Um, dear family, so I can ask you um, the same question. When you, when you, I suppose, when you have a, a client who's recently arrived in these shores, new, a new, a new London-based HNW, um, what are the reasons that they've, been, they've come here, in your opinion? Look, it's a combination, I would say. We, one, typically was the lifestyle. They do like the, the London lifestyle. Wealth planning was another reason for some of them. Schooling, a very important factor, especially we even saw families that the father stays in the country of origin and then the mother and the children move here simply to educate their children on the English system. And also we had a few clients who moved here for safety because there were a lot of kidnappings in their countries or they felt that they could be targeted uh, to be kidnapped or for their safety of their children. So they felt, let's move the family to London mm. and stay here. It's much safer. Mm. Okay, so um, uh, Chris uh, Kylin of Henley & Partners. Um, Chris, I ask you, you... you we should have the big picture on this one. We've, our panelists have talked about safety um, being a big factor, but education as well. And obviously we've touched on healthcare um, and food mobility. What, what, is there a hierarchy that you observe? No, it depends also on, I, I think I would agree with, with all of those points we just heard from my colleagues. I think it depends also on the, you know, geographic region in the world you're, you're looking at. You know, so let's say a South African family has the typical combined problem of they have a relatively bad passport to travel on, um, but also they don't know what's happening with their country. They don't know if in five years you can still live there or if it will turn out like Zimbabwe. They like to stay in South Africa, but you know they have this combined issue. And um, then maybe the children, uh, like we heard as well, they might want to educate them in the UK or in Switzerland or in Australia. That's another factor. Um, and then now you have the new or a newer dimension that has become very big and that's the healthcare. So people are very much looking at uh, how this now looks like after this pandemic, how countries have managed things where it might be safer from a health point of view. And, and here, very interestingly, some of the smaller countries, including some of the countries that we have advised on and many of our clients obtain citizenship from, they are small island states, which almost all of them have managed extremely well. So for instance, St. Lucia has had almost no COVID cases and very safe haven. So it's not a bad idea maybe to have a, a citizenship from one of those countries where you have a safe haven to go to that are also clean and healthy to be and, and uh, sit out the next pandemic. I mean, this is now on, on the front of uh, mind a lot of people. Um, okay. But the traditional drivers obviously are still the most important. Uh, so. Okay, well, in that case, um, I'll turn to a broader question then on the investment migration industry. Um, you know, it's not been without its critics, as I'm sure you all are aware. Um, so, Chris, I suppose it's important to know how Henley and Partners has, uh, and the industry has responded to concerns about things like due diligence um, and governance in this. Uh, would you say a little bit about that, please? Yeah, I would say, you know, largely this discussion is driven by politi political agendas, and that's about it. Because if you look at the facts, they are completely different from the perceptions you have out there uh, very often. So let us take uh, citizenship by investment in Europe as an example. So you read very often that there are there a lot of uh, nefarious people coming through Malta and Cyprus, and that's terrible, and so on. No. So now there is no question that there are always there's always room for improvement, and there's no question that there are occasionally people that obtain residence rights or citizenship that probably shouldn't have been given those rights and documents. But if you look at things carefully, you will see, for instance, if you take this example with Europe, um, you have about a thousand cases of main applicants between mainly Austria, Malta and Cyprus in Europe that give citizenship, about 1,000. 
these 1,000, they are very well vetted. So it's not that there is no due diligence on these people. In fact, there is a lot more due diligence on them than any bank does on their clients. And it's a similar situation if, uh, let's say, UBS onboards 1,000 clients, they know out of 1,000, maybe 23 or 51 or 17 or whatever, there's a certain number per thousand that will turn out to be nefarious people despite their very strict due diligence. And the same is, let's say, Malta or Cyprus or any other country that, that grants citizenship. But you have, let's say, 1,000 of them. But you know how many citizenships the EU grants every year throughout the EU? It's nearly 1 million. So you have 1 million citizenships that are granted by naturalization of other means in EU and 1,000 by, by investment. These 1,000 are very well vetted, whereas the rest is mostly done without due diligence or very limited due diligence. So really, if you look at that, there is an issue, but the issue is actually not with this 1,000, but it's with this 1 million where there is largely no issue, uh, but largely no due diligence, excuse me, and where there is a big room for improvement. Because if you give 1 million citizenships a year, with largely no due diligence, then for sure there are tens of thousands of people that are coming into the EU um, that for sure are a problem. And so I would simply say this, does get, this, this discussion has to be more factual. And if you have an honest factual discussion, it's very clear. You know? And I am convinced that that will happen in the future because the situation is it's so clear that it's not a, a question of opinion. It's just currently very one-sided and that's mainly politically driven and it's of course a very convenient target but the facts are very clear and I believe facts will always prevail. Christian thank you very much and um, uh, Keris can I ask you if you've got any thoughts about any change perception about investment migration and uh, someone who's worked in it for many years? Well it's certainly true that the press um, has taken against it uh, in, uh, in the anyway but I'm, I'm with Chris on that it's, it's purely a political agenda um, and I certainly agree about the vetting because I've had a couple of clients going through the Malta procedure and frankly I've never seen such extensive due diligence it's an absolutely enormous um, tome you know of, of stuff you have to provide going right back into your dim and distant past so um, I do think they're certainly if their act isn't already got together, then I, they are getting it together very much so, um, certainly in Malta. Haven't had much experience recently in Cyprus, I have to say. Um, and Austria, um, it's much more difficult, isn't it, Chris, to, um, to get citizenship there in any event. Um, so I imagine their numbers are lower than Malta. So, yeah. But, but yeah. all three countries, they do quite a lot of due diligence anyway. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you compare that with, let's say, the ancestry provisions in Romania, Bulgaria or Hungary, whereby the tens of thousands people are granted Bulgarian, Romanian and so on passports mm. without any checks. This is just unbelievable. Okay. Yes. <laughs> this is the problem. Wow. We really have a problem, but it's somewhere else. Yes, yes. yes. I'll, um, I'm going to spare um, Theophanes answering questions on the number of rotten apples who do or don't get admitted. Uh, as, as Chris yeah, was alluding yeah. to. Um, and I move on to a broader question, which is about a different set of perceptions, but about nationality. You know, it strikes me we're sitting here talking about uh, where people choose to live. Do we think, um, and I'll relate to our title as well, you know, um, that reference to personal sovereignty in the title, of sovereignty at least, do we think that our attitudes and our connectivity to where we're born is changing and that globalization has changed our views upon basically individual liberties being constrained by where you're born and if it happens to be a country where you know for historic reasons 50 years ago it wasn't wealthy there aren't many uh, any more visa restrictions than there are elsewhere it's not really very fair and what, what do we think about that Chris I'm going to ask you first to offer a piece on that. Yeah, I, I definitely think that these things, these attitudes have changed dramatically vis-a-vis -vis particularly belonging and citizenship. Um, because basically what you have, you have still a citizenship system that is very outdated and goes back to the national state that still had national armies where most, mostly only men were in the army. And of course, when you have France fighting against Germany and everybody is fighting, 
first of all, where you belong to and the citizenship you hold makes a big difference. And also, you cannot be dual citizen of France and Germany in such a world. However, we moved on a lot from that world. You know, basically today we don't have these kind of conflicts, certainly not in the developed world. Um, we have different um, uh, asymmetric conflicts around the world. Um, most countries have abolished military service. We have professional, smaller armies. Dual citizenship is more and more allowed and people are more associated with who they are and what they do. So the, the, the connection amongst the young people that like soccer is across the world and it doesn't matter so much where you are or it depends according to your profession or what you do. So there are other groups that are more strong than nationality. Nationality citizenship today, how it's lived today is more like a membership club. So you belong to the membership club of, say, UK, as a UK citizen. And the way people think is basically, what do I contribute and what do I get? In other words, what taxes I pay and other things I have to do, and what do I get? Schooling, uh, how are the roads, the connections, the trains, and things like that. And this is the way people today already think about citizenship. So more or less like a club. When you think of this like a club, then you're also very close to saying, well, why not open this club to suitable additional members that contribute to that club? So, Christian, you think that's the today thinking. Yeah. So, your answer is yes, it's fundamentally changed this viewpoint of nationality. <laughs> In short, now, yes. I'll turn to you, uh, dear Fannis, what's your view? Do you think, um, you know, where, where do you stand on this? Look, uh, obviously, that when it comes to the banking world, I would say that national, we need to understand how a person generated their wealth. What did, their nationality doesn't matter, it's more how did you generate your money and how was that wealth built over time? So that's an important part. The nationality does not matter. If you, even if you come with a European passport and you didn't do your, and let's say your source of wealth doesn't much what we would expect definitely you cannot open an account with us so it's irrelevant for us it's more like you are one person irrespective of your nationality very good okay i'll move on keris what's your view about the changing perceptions of nationality i'll, I'll ask you to give uh, me in 30 seconds please okay i agree with christian that it's much more fluid these days those people who can acquire a second passport are much more open to it than they ever used to be Okay. Remember. And on that note, that leads to my last question, and I'd like a rapid answer, just a couple of seconds on each one, please. What two passports do we, does a self-respecting UHMW need in his or her briefcase uh, today? Um, I'll start with you, Chris, because you should know, and you'd be most best prepared to answer that one. If you just have two, I would say you need an EU passport and something else. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. Uh, Keris, may I ask you next? I think I'll go for British and Swiss, please. <laughs> so very safe. Uh, dear Fannis. Well, I would say whatever would, make their, whatever would make them convenient for their traveling and where they want to live. I'm not going to say which two passports, but I'm sure every person <laughs> has, is traveling to certain countries and I'm sure they would like to make their traveling easier. Perfect. Well, that's great. So, uh, panellists, thank you very much indeed. That brings us to the end of the uh, pre-recorded part of this discussion. Um, we're now going to close this, but um, just to say to those who are uh, tuning in, um, if you close down this session and then open up the next one in the auditorium, you can be take part in our live question and answer session, uh, which we broadcast immediately after this. Thanks for listening and watching, and thank you to my panellists. Um, this has been a very enjoyable discussion, and uh, and we will now continue it with the Q&A.